Hi guys, this is Carl from Gunplot Colorado and I'm here with my first tutorial video and this is going to be how to make an easy rock base such as this one for an HG scale Gunpla 1144 scale and right here I have a sample of a previous piece I've done, this is actually the first one I've tried and we're going to just go step by step and show you how to make this and this is a quick, easy and really fun way to make a cool little rock base for your HG Gundams and you can get this done, believe it or not in under 15 hours, which is a great way to just spice up your model if you have it on deadline for a competition or you just want to make a really quick and fun base for your gun plug. Uh, a couple reasons why uh, I'm doing this video. Uh, I had posted pictures of this uh, first build on Instagram and I had a couple people ask me how to make this and how fast it was and I've also got a couple requests from Gunblog Colorado members to actually make these for them but it's so simple and fun I thought a tutorial video would go great to show you guys how you can make this and all in all not including paint all we need really is a mold epoxy clay and that is it and that these two items combined cost only $25 10 for the mold and 15 for the epoxy clay here um, my inspiration for these rock bases were based off of these wonderful uh, Hiro and Relina figurines that came with these astounding little rock bases and I had thought about casting them to make my own bases but luckily I found a mold here that already fit the bill and that is that base and I'll show you Relina's base and again beautiful figure um, but these rock bases are incredible. Now the first thing I noticed about these bases was their scale was a little off too so these large chunks of rocks don't really translate well to scaling with a 1144 gun plot. So I found this rock mold made by Woodland Scenics. This is a very old mold, um, but for $10 you really can't beat it. It comes with a very large portion here and then two smaller rock portions here. And if you want to find this exact mold, it is the Weathered Rock C1238 mold. And like I said, you can't see it really well in the camera here, but this is 1992, so this is a 27 year old mold um, as of this filming. So, but this is a great little mold. It does have some issues that we're gonna go over later in the molding process, but for what we need, this is perfect. Nice and wide. It's got some, and you can see the top here. It's got some nice smooth edges. This is great for where you're putting legs. You can have some nice little layered effects. And as you can see from the final model, the details will really shine out on the top here. So now for our molding material we are going to be using the Aves Epoxy Clay. Uh, now this is very similar to the Aves Epoxy Sculpt. The only real difference is the Epoxy Sculpt, which is great for casting uh, new parts and making scratch build parts, is the consistency of the sculpt is more like a putty, um, a softer, more malleable putty. Well this consistency is more like clay, though basically they have the same properties. Um, they have a, a good little working time around about an, excuse me, about an hour, and then after 24 hours, they are rock solid. Um, however, on my first build, this cured only for 12 and a half hours. So if you were in a rush to make a nice base, this is the way to do it. Now, there are alternatives you can use, such as um, plaster or resin, but they do add weight to the base. And if you can see here, with the materials of the clay, you can really push it into the mold while not having so much volume here. And this really cuts down the weight of the base, which I like as well, especially if you have to travel with a model uh, for any competitions or stuff like that. And the last things that we're gonna need, besides the mold and our clay, are Amex gloves. These are uh, nitrate gloves. And if you need to know which gloves those are, these are just Amex black nitrile. Um, I love these gloves for modeling. Uh, keeps all the oils off my hands from all my models and smudging um, really cheap about eight to ten bucks on Amazon you can get them wherever packs of 100 and we're gonna need these uh, because of the clay and the chemical properties of the clay and I will go into that while we're actually uh, mixing the clay the last thing we're gonna need is some scooping or um, how do I say spoon device uh, you can use a spoon if you want and that's just to get the clay out of here um, without messing it up so let's get into it. We're gonna start by opening up our clay. This is vacuum sealed, so you might wanna just get a little knife here. Cut into that. And we have our 
a cup. And we have our B cup. Now the instructions for using this clay are on the back of the instructions, but I'm just gonna walk you through the simple bit. Simple version of it. So let's get our gloves on here because these do have some adverse effects to your skin that you do not want. All right, so we're gonna take our epoxy A clay, open it up, and you can see it is this grayish, obviously clay-like material. And the B is a little stickier, but it is a creamier, whiter version of the clay. Now, for this original mold, I thought I was able to get away with just using half and half of this mixture. Now, you do have to mix the A and B materials in a 50-50 even distribution. Um, I thought I was able to get most of this mold done with half, but I have learned that you will need the full use of the clay and the full use of the B clay, the A and B clay, I should say. Um, now, we're going to mix this in two parts because this stuff is hard to mix. The clay-like um, properties of it does give your hands a good little workout. So we're going to mix it half at a time, half at a time, and you'll see how we do that process. So I'm going to make my first base go over here for a little bit. I'm going to take my scooping material and roughly I'm going to scoop out half of this mixture. Now it is, like I said, a very dense clay. So you're going to really need to get in there. Pry that sucker out. There we go. And it looks like I have a spoke tip off there. That's all right. Very hard. And we have roughly about half of the mixture here. So we're going to ball that up for the second and just kind of put it here on the top of the thing. Now we're going to take our B material. And this is a little wetter. As you'll notice here, there's a little bit of a residue on top of the cup. So now normally I would say do not use the same scoop for both materials if you were using a smaller mixture of this. But since we're going to be using the entire portion of it, it doesn't really matter in this case. Um, if you want to, just for cleanliness sake, I'm just going to take a towel here, my trusty blue towels from AutoZone. Three bucks a pop, best towels there are for modeling, in my opinion. I'm just going to wipe that off down real fast. And let's get back to scooping. See, this is kind of like pulling taffy here. The world's hardest mochi. I'm just gonna get as much out as we can to make sure we have roughly half of it to match the A. It is being very difficult, but it will definitely come into line once you start really mixing it up so at this point it just doesn't want to come out of here so definitely use a metal spoon if you're going to be using a spoon to get this stuff out because you will break your plastic spoon in half all right so roughly we have about the same amount so you can see what's left over here and i have my first portion just going to ball it up for convenience sake all right, now, mixing the clay is the most important part of the process here. So let's just get the rest of that off there. Now, the best way to mix this is not to just rub two balls together. So we're gonna basically do what I call the hand-drawn noodle technique. So I'm gonna take our A compound here, start rolling it up to some long tubes here. Really try to get it like a long worm here. And it definitely behaves a little better once it's out of the tub. And we've got a nice long little Twizzler here. And I'm just going to hold that right here. And we're going to do the same with the B compound. Now you do have a good working time of this from about 15 minutes to an hour. It will get harder to work with the longer you let it out, but you should have plenty of time to do what you need to do here. So we have, 
I like to make sure that my ropes are roughly the same length here. So the first thing we're going to do once we have our two ropes is we're going to just twist them around. And they're being difficult right now, so there we go. A nice long nerds rope. Just twist that up, try to keep it from breaking, but it doesn't really matter if it breaks or not. And we have a kind of DNA strand of our A and our B compound in now. I'm going to loop that over and we're going to just start working. Now this is going to be the most intensive part of making this rock base. Uh, the last time I was rubbing this down, I had a pretty sore hands afterwards, but uh, you know, there are different ways to mix this. I just find this is the best way. No. The key is to make sure that we do not have a uh, white or gray left over. It will become a uniform sort of tan skin color once it's fully mixed. So make sure that we just keep stretching it out and we keep twisting it up. We just want to make sure that we get all of that color out of there. And we just make it all uniform. Forearms like Popeye when you're done with this. As you can see we're starting to get it mixed up a little bit more and we just keep twisting. Now we're also going to just start breaking off chunks of this, get a little better of the mixture in there. Now the key uh, to this mixture is that once the color starts getting kind of uniform here and you start losing the grays and the whites, you will actually feel the clay heat in your hand and that is the chemical reaction of the two compounds mixing together and it will not be hard to feel this heat and that's another reason why we want to wear these gloves. You don't want this chemical reaction going on on your bare skin. So definitely be wearing gloves while you're handling these compounds. As you can see we're already losing a lot of our grays and our whites and it's becoming much more uniform. We're going to start really working it here. this sit for five minutes after you've done the mix. Just let the chemicals start bonding with each other and making this super malleable that's going to be later super hard, rock hard substance. And as you can see, we have a pretty good consistency here. I don't see any specks of a single color, the gray or the white. Just keep that all closer for you. And now what I like to do, after I'm pretty sure it's well mixed, single ball out of it. There we go. You can tell the color is uniform. And we're going to let that sit for five minutes. And while we're doing that, we're going to mix the rest of our compound up because we are going to need all of this. Okay, we're back. Thanks for sitting through that. Now we have our two uniform balls here. And as you've noticed, I've taken off my gloves because I do not want any residue left from the A or the B compound. So I'm gonna put on a fresh pair to work with our mixtures. They have been setting for five minutes roughly. 
a little longer for the first one, but they should be the same consistency. So let's just get our gloves on here. All right, now it is time to set our mixture into our mold. So the first thing we're gonna do is take our first one that we used first, obviously. And we're gonna start stripping off little chunks kind of flattening it out in your fingers, getting it nice and smooth. Another plus of using gloves is you won't leave any thumb marks. Now that won't really be a huge deal on the bottom of the mold, but if you care about the top of the mold, it may definitely leave some little marks in there. So as you can see, this is really smooth. There's no thumb marks in there. So we're gonna just stretch this out. And we're gonna start filling our base. Now we wanna start with the deeper portions of the base and really push it in there because that's where all our little crevices, our little crags, and our details are gonna come out. So, let's start doing that. Now, like I said, this is not a one-size-fits-all method. You can use all different sorts of molds, uh, casting materials such as resin, plaster. I just prefer this method because it's quick. It only has one thing you need to buy, which is the epoxy clay. There's no mixing other than mixing the clay measuring it's just making the clay and filling in your mold now as you start pushing in there you're going to find out that some of the crags are really going to take a lot of the clay and really thin this out so when you have a deep crack or crevice you really want to put some extra clay in there just to be safe and if the great thing is that if you punch through the clay a bit and you hit the bottom you're going to see little dark marks of the mold so with the white I'll just make a little crack in here with the white of the clay the little black spots will really pop out in this where you gotta know that you gotta fill it in a little bit more don't be afraid to take out a little rage on this really get in there and push it so we're just gonna keep repeating the process stripping off little strips flattening it out a bit Our volume. Now, before I fast forward this, because you don't want to be watching me do this for the entirety of this, I'm going to show you what I'm going to be doing on the edges, and this is going to be really important later uh, when we're pulling it out of the cast. Now I want to have a little lip over these edges and the reason for that is twofold. Um, I want to be able to kind of grab it and pull it out of the mold a little easier. Now this really comes out of the mold easy no matter what you do, but it's good to have just a little piece you can latch onto and grab to help it pull out. And the second reason is the nature of this mold, and I believe this is a, how would I put it? maybe a resin or poly, poly plastic mold is that this does not sit flat very well. So we don't really care about that for the top of the mold, but for the bottom of the base, we want this to be flat so we can lay it on the surface. And to help that out, we're gonna have a little lip around here and it'll still be uneven uh, when you pull it out of the mold. Now, the way we're gonna solve that problem is we're gonna have sanding, um, a nice sanding sheet and we're just gonna rub it on top of the sanding sheet to flatten out the bottom But in order to really help that out and make sure you don't lose any of the fine details around the edges when We come in to our edges here Make sure that we fill in the gaps We're gonna leave just a very tiny lip I'll show you that Oops, my head there. We're gonna leave a thin lip around the edge. Make sure that we fill in everything on the sides, push it in. Make sure we have a little bit of lip on the mold. As you can see right there on the edge we have a little bit of lip and it'll, it'll be easy to break off when we don't want it and it'll also help us to give a little edge that we can sand to make sure it's flat without losing any of the details on the side. Because if we sand too deep we're going to start getting into the, the good parts of the mold as I call them. And we're just gonna rinse and repeat this. And like I said, if you have large crevices, large edges, 
make sure to just give that a little bit more love to make sure that they are solid and they don't break. Now this is going to be very hard and very hard to break, but better safe than sorry. If you feel that these little depths need a little bit more loving, just give it a little extra push. And this will really also help bring out the details on the back when you keep pushing into the mold. And we're going to let you fast forward here and I'll show you the rest of the process. And we are back. And as you can see, I've completely filled up the mold. It is nice, filled. We have a nice little lip around the entire edge of the mold. And I have reinforced some of the edge structures here and really pushed in deep to where the depth of the mold goes in the farthest, especially on these edges. So it gave a little extra support to the edge of the mold and to the deepest parts and to any ridge lines that you can see from the inverse of the mold. Now, as I said, this mold in particular is a really floppy kind of plastic, so keeping this completely flat is going to be near to impossible, but I have a little trick to help this out, and after this is done curing, we're also going to keep um, flattening out the base uh, using sanding techniques, and that's why I really like this. Um, instead of a very heavy resin or plaster mold, um, this is lightweight and the only sanding you're going to have to do is around the edge to keep the entire mold flat. Um, one note, um, I usually, uh, when displaying my Gundams, I usually like to do a non-destructive way of mounting my Gundams to a base, so I will use um, some blue poster tack and um, usually the Loctite tack, and if I can grab this off here without destroying my entire workbench. Uh, this kind of tack is great for that. However, if you have a heavier or more off-balance mold, you will probably want to make a small hole down to the tip of the, um, I should say the tip, the edge of your mold. And you can use all sorts of uh, mounting pieces for that. You can use either styrene tubes or anything like that to make your hole. This is a 3 16th um, evergreen tube. And there is also a very nice, thin, clear um, mounting rod made by Plastruck. This is the 90251 1.6mm fluorescent rod. So if you are planning to use rods to mount your suit, this would be a good time to come in and make holes the size of the rods you want to use. Um, as long as you make the hole, once it hardens, you'll have no problem sticking the rod through the mold if it's the same size. So with that in mind, I am not going to be using mounting rod. What I am going to do though is try to use something flat to keep the edges and the mold itself as straight as possible while it's curing. Um, you can use a piece of cardboard, any hard piece of metal, and I totally off-centered my camera there. Sorry about that. Didn't even realize. Oh, we're going to go like that for now. So what I have here is just a Infini uh, cutting mat. <coughs> Not a paid placement, but an incredible simulation. These are great for um, cutting out masking tape to specific shapes and sizes. But in this case, it is a flat hardboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to place that right on top here. And I have a standard assortment of clamps, large, small, and closed pins. And all I'm going to do is clamp this sucker down the best I can. don't have to worry about air pockets or drying or anything like that and that's another reason I like this clay as opposed to any resin or plaster molding. You don't have to worry about air, bubbles, anything like that. It is just rock solid. So i my OCD here but just going to put as many clamps as I can on here to try and keep this as flat as possible. Like I said it will not be completely flat when it is done but we will solve that problem post curing. And seeing as it is now 
11.55. We're only gonna wait about 12 or 13 hours, and this should be ready to go for painting. So, as you can see, I have my kind of Hellraiser clamping system down here, but we're just gonna set this off to the side, and we're gonna let that dry, and I'll see you in 13 hours. All right, we're back. It has been well over 12, 13 hours, so we're gonna pop off our mold and see what we got here. Let's take all the clamps off. Let's see what we got. That just snaps right off. And as you can tell, this is already very hard, so let's just pull it out here. Another reason I like using this epoxy clay is it really does not stick to your mold here. And there we go. Look at that. Nice and smooth. Great detail on this one. Great detail. Lots of cracks and crevices. It is a little shinier, but don't worry about that. We'll get rid of it. And now you can also see the point of making the lip. Now, we have the... Get the light in there for you. We have a nice flat lip around the edges. So, of course, we need to remove that. But luckily enough, if you make it thin enough, you can just snap the pieces off right there. And we'll, of course, clean this up with some sanding, but this... This is just more enjoyable. Now that part's a little harder. But a little work in there. Should be fine. Now we got some sharp edges here that aren't going to pop off too easily unless we use a good little piece of our nail. And a couple things to clean up. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little metal sanding file, something like this. Usually you could find these in any uh, nail treatment kits or anything like that. Just a spot here. And what you can do is just... Sand those sharp edges down. You can also use the end if you have any stubborn parts of your lip. And I'm sanding this inward so we don't have any, as I call them, sanding artifacts pointing outwards from the bottom of the base, so it all just... Alright, so it looks like we got most of our edge smoothed out. Now, the important thing is to test, and like I said, with this mold, the one drawback of this mold is it is not entirely flat. It's kind of a curvy, smooth surface, so... Yes, so as I'm laying this flat on my tail, I can see there are some points where it's not entirely flat on the bottom, so the center of the mold is a little taller than the edges of the mold, which have a little bit of height on them. But we have a solution for that, and that, thankfully, is easy. It is just, we have some 323M sandpaper here, and we're just gonna tape that to our table, and we're just gonna sand down the bottom of our base. So. Grab a sheet of this. And this is not the grittiest sandpaper, but it will do what we need it to do. So I'm gonna tape this down. I'm just gonna use some regular old masking tape. It'll get torn up a bit, but it should do the job. So get it straight right there. So now we're just gonna grab our rock, and this is very solid, so you don't have to worry about this breaking at all. And we're just going to sand down, and it does seem the center is a little more higher than the, set, the uh, edges of the rock, so we're going to sand the middle of that down. All 
All right, I think we've got it as flat as we're gonna get it. And it is pretty level. Using the ruler here to make sure that we have some level surface here. There's no wobble, and we'll put it on the table. All right, so gonna clean this up a bit. This powder is very fine, so try not to inhale it, or use a respirator if you want to. And I'll see you in a second. All right, so we've cleaned our workspace up, I've taken off my gloves, and the last step to do before painting is just make sure that our sculpt here is clean with some dirt. Just have a light brush here, just get all the dirt out of the cracks and crevices from sanding. The bottom, we don't have to worry about too much because that is not going to be receiving any paint. And the other great thing about epoxy clay, which is a boon, or some other techniques like resin or plaster or anything like that is that we don't need to prime this base it is ready to go for paint just an added quality of the materials we're using and that's about as clean as we're going to get it we're just going to run over it with a damp little towel real quick to make sure we didn't miss any spots all right so the first thing we do before we get any paint is we're just going to set up our little painting station here and i have this very odd little uh, wired little table here with some legs on it, but it is perfect for what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to have some more of my favorite blue AutoZone chamois cloths. I'm just going to wrap that under so nothing drips. And this is going to be our painting surface. Put the rock there. And I'm going to have another little side towel next to me for my brushes. Got three little paint cups. These are epoxy paint cups, but they work exactly the same. So my previous build was a lot darker uh, than I expected it to be. I had a mid-tone, a dark tone, and I brushed up with some highlights. Uh, we're going to follow the same principle, except we're going to change our colors up a bit. So our dark tone that we're going to lay down first is going to be a mixture of some NATO brown here, XF68 to me. And then our overall tone, the top tone that we're going to put on, is going to be a mix of Desert Yellow X59 and some Flat Base X21. Uh, the reason for this is I want a really washed but definitely contrasted look. So this is a little too saturated for me, but it's the right tone, so I'm going to bring that down. Um, actually, this is the right tone, not the right saturation, so I'm going to bring down the saturation a little bit with this gray. And of course, we'll just need some X28 thinner and a couple brushes. A neat trick that most lady gunpla builders know already, and that is old makeup brushes like this. This is a NARS uh, powder brush, and these are just some freebie old liner brushes. These are just as good as paint brushes, and if your girlfriend's not using them, they're done. She's about to throw them away. Keep these. These are great. Save you money on brushes. So keep those out. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our XO68 and give that a good shaking. And I do like to mix it up a bit with some toothpicks as well to get all the sediment on the bottom mixed up as paint always settles and you really gotta give it some love. So one of the tricks that we're gonna be using here, this is a really nice brown I love, I love the NATO lines of colors, the NATO browns, military grays and all that stuff. Just great colors. They're great for terrain as well, so don't discount them. So we got a good mix here, nice and consistent. And I'm just gonna put my toothpick right here for reference. Get a little dropper out. Oops, looks like I haven't snipped this dropper yet. thing about painting these rocks with this technique is you do not need that much paint. We've only got about four half droppers here. So roughly about, oh, let's say 25 milliliters of paint here. So as I've seen, I already have paint on my fingers, so I'm going to put some gloves on here. 
Now the first coat, I want it thin, but I don't want it too thin. So I'm just gonna eyeball roughly about 25, maybe less milliliters of thinner here. Let's take this, take an empty cup and mix that out. Pour that into my paint. Spilled a little. That should be fine. And we're going to take our big little brush here and we're just going to get in there. Soak the brush up nice and well. Give it a little mix. And start painting. Wipe my brush down because it's heavily soaked in paint. And I'm just going to dry brush this a bit to get some of the excess off. And help it dry a little faster. Right, and we're back, and all I've done after the skip was mix up my paints a bit, the flat base and the desert yellow, and we're going to go ahead and get that all mixed up. Don't have a lot of the desert yellow le uh, left in my jar, so I'm just going to pour that out here. Should be enough for what we want to do. Pour a little bit of thinner in here. Get some extra paint out. Just switch that up a bit. Don't be afraid to add a little white or some dark black paint to get a nice color you want if it's not the perfect color. In fact, I think I'm going to do that just then. I'm going to grab some pure white. This is Mecca Vallejo Pure White. Normally I'd grab a Tamiya, but this comes in a beautiful little squirt bottle, so I'm just going to give it a couple tips here. Might have mixed too much paint, but you know what? That's a good problem to have. All right, so we're gonna go in same as before. I'm not gonna clean this brush off. I do like to have a little bit of, a little bit of grit in there to mix up the color variation, but I'm gonna soak it nice and gently into our cup here. And this is a lot thinner than our first darker paint. So this should just go on nice and wet, but because it is thinner, Gonna break it up a little bit and not completely stick to the bottom so we have this nice variation of color. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did with the top coat. I'm gonna kind of dry my brush off a little bit and just start soaking up excess paint. Just a little bit of thinner. You don't want to soak it completely through. I do want to lift off some of that top layer of paint just a bit. So. It can be hard to tell from up there 
but I do have some parts where this yellow is starting to fade a bit and get more of that darker under color that we laid down first and that is what we're looking for. Desert yellow, we have our top. This is kind of right in between those two colors with the amount of variation we're doing. But we do want to do some highlighting and some shadowing. So what we're going to do now is this XF59 Desert Yellow is pretty much spent, so I'm going to toss that. And I'm going to grab a new one here, mix it up. But what we're going to do is we are not going to thin this, and we are not going to mix this with any other color. because this is a beautiful color. Now we're going to take a really small thin brush. This is an old makeup brush, but you can find anything like that. It's just small enough that we can use it. It's actually kind of a push brush. And what we're going to do is we're going to dry brush some nice little highlight decals on here. I say decals, but I should say details. But nice little highlight details. So we're going to load up our brush with paint, and then we're going to get rid of most of it, but you should be able to see just a bit when you brush, just a bit. And we're going to go over some areas where we think we need some highlights. Now if you think about rocks, the most exposed parts of the rocks, edges, flat surfaces, they're going to have some smooth, sun bleached areas. So I'm just going to find some edges here and just drop down some very, very light highlight work. Now this won't pop immediately, but once you see it up close, these details really do shine and come through. Anywhere where it's raised, where I think it's been more exposed than any other part of the rock, especially in these top little cracks and crags, give it a little bit of a once over. And don't be afraid to get some more paint, wipe it off, and come in here. Conversely, you can do this with dark paint as well. We have a different little tool we're going to use for that. It's one of my favorite paints. Or should I say painting tools? Be random is the best advice I can give you painting this. Be random, but be targeted. Great part about this rock is that because the acrylic paint dries so fast, you can go ahead and just touch this not worry about finger smudges or anything like that. Leave the gloves on. Give that a little bit too much paint, so I'm gonna come back over here. Try and dry that off. So you know what looks good either way. Now I'm gonna hit some of the flat parts. I think they've been sun bleached. All we're looking for is some good variation here. Some nice randomized storytelling with your paint. I'm gonna grab one more of those little brushes because I have an entire pack of them. Here is the Coup de Gras, Mr. Weather and Color. This is WCO2, this is the ground brown. The multi-black is the more popular version for Gundams, but I love ground brown. It's just a little, a little grimier, a little greasier. And this stuff just makes everything look so disgustingly dirty, and I love it. So shake that up, it's got a little ball inside it. Take our long little thin brush, which is perfect for the size. As you can tell, it's already loaded up. First place we're going to go is into these cracks. We're going to give these cracks a nice, open, even amount of this stuff because it will help. 
anywhere you see a crack or a crevice, get in there with that stuff. Works a lot like panel line liquid, but it is not an enamel paint. It is an oil-based paint. As anyone who knows, if you try to do this with uh, to me a panel line, this will destroy a model because the enamel loves to eat through that stuff. Getting into this crack right here, which is a nice, beautiful detail in that mold. perfect with these uh, strokes here. We're just filling gaps. Don't forget the sides either. Now we're putting the most amount of this stuff, like I said, in the cracks, the crevices. The place will be nice and dark. And I'll show you what we're going to do with the rest of the model here in a second. off of here. I don't want too much. I do want some, but just not as much as I want for here. And we're just going to start lightly brushing this. And you can see it's a lot thinner. Brushing that all over the model. here sit for about uh, let's say five minutes and then we're gonna come in and clean this off and you're gonna see the results and they're gonna be awesome all right we're back so now it's been about five minutes we're gonna take a nice chamois cloth here and don't be afraid to get in here we're gonna wipe off a lot of this that's the fun part about this oil seeped into the cracks. The top is a little dark, but not as dark as the cracks. We've got variations, we've got edges, we've got a lot of nice details in here. And don't worry about this shine on the rock, we're going to take care of that with a matte coat. Now the rest of this that we're going to work on is optional. You can always add a little bit of foliage or a little bit of weeds, something in there to kind of just add some more visual interest. I personally like to use these Vallejo environment paints. These are wonderful for weathering, for anything like that. Um, the only thing I would say about these is their color is not exactly what we're going for. This doesn't really stand out. This uh, It's almost the same color tone as our rock, but I want to lighten it up a bit. so easy way to solve that and my favorite way to paint with these is actually paint with toothpicks so I'm going to take a good little wad here it's got some nice fibrous pieces in there which are just I don't know if you can tell very well with the camera here but there's the look of some old trampled grass in there so what I'm going to do is take that I'm going to kind of dump it here into my previously made desert paint. Let's kind of soak that up a bit. 
Now it's a lot much more contrasty tone. I'm gonna get another toothpick here. Dry off some of the excess. Get a little bit more of our desert yellowish stuff here. Places where you never know, you might see some weeds growing out of rocks. Some foliage, some algae that grows. I'm just gonna add that in there. Get all of that good fiber stuff. And our rock is done with the painting phase. Let me go give this a top coat and we'll be right back. All right, so we have finished the top coat. And if anyone was wondering, this is a Tester's Spray Lacquer Dull Coat. It's hard to focus here, but I do love the Tester's for spray lacquers, um, especially top coats, gloss and dull. And we definitely want a dull coat on this to make sure we don't have any um, shine off our rock but as you can tell this is a wonderful little rock a lot of cool little color variations I'll try and focus here so you can see some more there we go got some dark crevices some cracks that's a little better lightweight easy to move and perfect for hgs and I have a little sample here. Let me just get refocused. Have a uh, just a snap belt here, Leo, that we're gonna put onto this base. And I don't even need blue tech for that one. And as you can see, this is the perfect scale for a quick and dirty little rock base for any HG Gunpla. Uh, let me know if you want to see more tutorials like this. Uh, if you have any questions, just leave a comment or find us on Gunplot Colorado Facebook group and uh, go and join us and see what you want to see from us. We are always having events, builds, little tips and tricks like this. And uh, if you want to catch me on Instagram, uh, it is at goalie zero. Uh, the zero at the end is a number. Uh, but thanks for joining me. Um, I'll try to be a little more professional next time. But uh, first tutorial in the books. And uh, if you're interested in any of the other techniques or tools or um, paints that I use, just uh, write me a little comment and I'll let you know. Thanks.